Hello there, welcome back to some more Disco Elysium. In the last episode, we spoke to people in the fishing village, and now we're looking for a lost jacket while also going around and talking to the remaining people of this quaint little area that is not on any maps. The boy bobs in the water, the number on it says 11. Ah, we found the archaeologists, the cryptozoologists. Tiny cages, carefully constructed. Hello, friend. Your wife's looking for you, you daft Here prick. Go. Nice and easy. No way out, little guys. Not out of this gym. There's a cylinder on the ground in which the man is arranging some netting. It looks like some kind of trap. He notices you. Who's there? Oh, the police. Hello, officers. Hello. His self-conscious enthusiasm renders his movements ungainly. He looks like your understanding of a scientist. Is that the police? Why are the police here? Don't worry, Gary. I'll handle it. Fucking Gary. Gaza. You must be well, the cryptozoologist. So what do I owe the pleasure? That's sarcasm. He takes no pleasure from your appearance. Lena sent me. She's been really, really rude about you and is waiting for you to get back. Yeah, of course. Thank you for passing along the message. That damn water lock is broken. And we can't go all the way around the 881. The 881 is a raised motorway that separates Martinez from Jamrock. The labyrinth of streets underneath it makes it difficult to pass. Not like walking over a nice water lock. Yeah, that was me. I broke the water lock with the motor carriage, but it's fixed now. You can go back. You broke the water lock with a motor carriage? There was a billboard in the canal. Not a vehicle. It said Samaran Butter. Now, you see, I jumped over the canal on my motor carriage, tearing through the snow, and put a sandwich, then fell into the canal, blocking the gates. I used the pawn shop as a launch ramp. Why? It was an experiment to gauge the Cooper's 40s aerial performance. I'm something of a gentleman scientist. Scientist. Yes, okay. But you, you could... said the water lock is fixed now. So we can go back. You can. Did he say we can go back now? Yes, Gary. We can go soon. If you see Lena, tell her I won't be long. All right, sir. Your wife is waiting for you. I just have to do one more round. See if the phasmid has taken the bait. Then we go in. Tell me about this phasmid you're looking for. He refastens a bit of netting to come loose in the wind. Mm. Well, first of all, it's damn difficult to find, which is why we've been knee-deep in the reeds laying traps for it. How big is the phasmid? I'm expecting it to be quite giant. One known species of phasmid, called the Megaphasmodea zoensis, is about the size of a grown man's forearm. So, uh... He leaves the conclusion up to you. Seems puny, to be honest. Why, what makes it so difficult to find? Good question. Being a phasmid of the order Phantasmodea, a ghost insect, it disguises itself as plant matter. In this case, the reeds. Awful lot of reeds around, aren't there? And I suspect it may have also developed other specialised techniques to protect itself from predators. All scientists, in our present case. What sort of specialised techniques is this phasmid using to hide itself? It's my hypothesis that it has evolved certain electrochemical defences that allow it to interfere with animal perception, impeding pattern recognition, confusing the visual cortex. Like a pheromone or something. But I cannot describe how these defences work, much less how they evolve, without studying a live specimen. A ghost insect, he said? These people are looking for a ghost. What have you discovered about it so far? Very little, I'm sorry to say. No one's ever captured a specimen, so all our information is based on first and third hand accounts. So no one's ever found one? Not yet. That's what makes it a cryptid. <clears throat> Just out of curiosity, if there's no proof of its existence, how do you know it's real? I know it's real. The, crypto the cryptozoologist says, brusquely enough, that even he seems taken aback by it. It's clear that his obsession with the phasmid is driven by something more than the pure pursuit of scientific advancement. Right. By which I mean, I've heard enough first-hand accounts to believe quite firmly that the Insulindian phasmid is more than mere superstition. Lena said there's been a sighting of it here in Martinez. Yes, the most recent sighting was by a couple of teenagers along the coast here. That's what brought us to Martinez specifically. Mm. It's the first credible sighting in several decades. Admittedly, 
It's an unusual location for this species, but with all the sewage runoff upstream, it probably doesn't matter much anymore. Maybe the insulin Indian phasmid has died out. I have to resist the thought. Such an extraordinary creature is doubtlessly highly resilient. After all, it's generally thought to be capable of parthenogenesis. He means asexual reproduction. The females of the species don't need to mate to produce viable eggs. This makes it easier for a species with a small population to survive. That's pretty clever. Yes, the Insulindian phasmid is a very clever insect. That's why it's so damn difficult to catch. But as a scientist, I'll try my best to remain dispassionate. Tell me more about the traps. Well, they may not look impressive, but Lena designed them quite cleverly. So I'm sure they'll do the trick. Lena designed the traps? Yes. She says with some pride. How do the traps work? Simple. Attracted by the locusts, the phasmid crawls down the funnel and, having eaten its fill, can get back out. At least, that's the intention. The net isn't a perfect solution, but we didn't want to use anything that might damage the specimen's delicate exoskeleton. What are you using as bait? Locusts. Nearly all known phasmids are herbivores, of course. But we've hypothesized that the Insulindian phasmid might occasionally prey on other insects. Okay. Inside the traps, a number of locusts crawl and tumble over one another in a tiny, chittering swarm. A meat-eating stick insect? Does it pretend to be the reeds as part of its ambush behavior? This seems unlikely. Kind of a stick insect seems unlikely. Thank you for your opinion. We have also included plant material in the traps to satiate your skepticism. What will you do if these traps don't work? They'll work, I assure you. The predatory hypothesis, using locusts as bait, accounts for the failure of previous efforts by other teams, which use plants. We have given this some thought. Let me ask you about something else. Yes. What? How'd you become a cryptozoologist? I've just always liked animals and puzzles. Searching for cryptids is a bit of both. Do you live in your childhood dream out here? It's not child's play. Just because I have to trade through the mud every so often. His eyes narrow. Have you ever discovered a cryptid? No. Very few cryptids are ever discovered. And not for a lack of trying. To stay hidden is a cryptid's primary quality. It's even in the name. Cryptid. How many cryptids have been found? Of the list of cryptids kept by the Cryptozoological Society of Shemney, which is 4,082 items long, about 2,000 have been confirmed as hoaxes. Mm. Two are categorised as confirmed discoveries. The rest are in differing stages of discovery, refutation and data collection. I mean, he says this as if it's only, but it makes sense that only two would have been found. Yes, the Chateau Quan forest pygmy, who turned out to be an extinct species of primate, and a cave salamander from Hugo Grad, who is... Honestly, quite unremarkable. It's in a zoo somewhere. We cryptozoologists are brutally honest with ourselves. More so even than the public. With cryptids, most cryptids are hoaxes or they are never found. That does not mean we should stop searching. Then the Insulindian Phasmid will be the third. Indeed. If our expedition is successful, every paper in the world will report on it. From Revachol to Dushan too. It will be a zoological miracle. He has clearly done his math on this. There is no surprising him or swaying his opinion. Thanks for explaining that. Now about something else. Yes. Let's talk about specific cryptids. All right. What cryptids precisely? I usually discuss these things with specialists, so I don't know what. We would have to discuss. He wants to say but decides against it. Just tell me about a cool cryptid. Any cryptid. No offence, officer, but I'm not much of a pedagogue. I don't know what I would have done if Lena hadn't persuaded me to go back to field research. You should ask her if you want interesting stories. Me? I'm not a people person, unless you haven't noticed. And I don't make a good lecturer. My strength lies in field work and persistence. He brushes an orange strand of hair from his eye. Enough tales then, let's change the subject. Means. I'll get going. Thank you. 
The soggy logs smell of ignition fluid. Still, they won't light up. Take some of that. Hello, Gary. Hello, I'm Gary. How do you do, officer? The crypto fascist. Yellow man. I mean, officer. The lieutenant raises his eyebrows slightly and takes out his notebook. Mm -hmm. I'm just waiting for my friend Morel to finish up with his insect traps so we can return to civilization. No love of the great outdoors? I like nature, just not this bloody coast. It's mostly drunks and degenerates that come here. Degenerates? Mm. This man respects authority too much. To see the truth inscribed upon thine own visage. Pretend thou art a paragon of virtue. No, neither of those things I can assure you. I'm a by the books, clean as a whistle, officer of the law. I'm not even tempted to touch intoxicants. I've been tempted on occasion. But someone has to stay strong for Revacol. Revacol, he says. His gaze shifts to the pile of soggy logs he at his feet. He pronounces Revacol with a hard K, unlike other people. He said Revacol. I like to pronounce it the hard way. The old way. The Vespertine way. He nods solemnly. It's a secret right. A very fringe nationalist handshake, probably. Are you a cryptozoologist too? No, no. I help Morel with research sometimes, and I've learned some things along the way. But I don't usually go in for picnics like this on my own. After all this time with Morel, he must have an opinion on cryptids. This could lead to a good one. I'm into cryptids. Do you have a favorite? Oh, yes. The Burning Rhino. Morel doubts he's real, but I don't much care, because I won't be the one looking for him out in Safra Serai. What's a burning rhino? A rhinoceros that looks ordinary during the day, but burns brightly by night. Well, at least the males do. Why only the males? The flames are not just for decoration. They are an integral part of the beast's mating behavior. I see. How so? During the burning rhino's mating season, herds of male rhinos, all aflame, encircle herds of female rhinos forming a fiery ring as they begin to copulate loudly. Local peasants call it the passion ring. They fear the rhinos, as perhaps they should. Anyway. The lieutenant sighs without looking up from his notes. It's clear the burning rhino is dear to him on many levels, some even spiritual. How do they burn? They have special ducts just above their shoulder blades that secrete a combustible fluid. When the rhino is just beginning to light itself, it looks as though it has wings of fire. Okay, yeah, so it can... It, sure, maybe it could excrete combustible fluid. How does it combust itself without dying? But how is this combustible fluid lit? How does the lighting of this fluid actually work? The rhino starts running very fast to I build see. Heat, then stops, raises its head, and sparks fly from its neck, setting its back ablaze. That seems unlikely. Yeah, well, Revacol used to be a flaming rhino once, a long time ago. That seems unlikely too, doesn't it? Super solid argument, Gary. Can't argue with that. You're surprised to see my left hand, uh, colleague Lieutenant Kitsuagi. Not many Seolites here, or anywhere, other than Seol. I meant no offense, truly. Do you remember how, when we met Measure Hat, I said the next racist would be a really good one? Yes. Well, this is that racist. Yes, our lucky hey, racist. Hey, man. All I meant was there are not many Seolites around here. I'm just stating a fact. The Lieutenant's a native of Evercol. Oh, yes. Of course he is. I was just speaking about his... connections. Let's change the subject, okay? Not no. many. Do you remember how when we well, Yes. This is that racist. He's nothing compared to Measurehead. I don't know who that is, but all I meant was there are not many Seolites around here. Do you have a problem with Seolites? No, no problem at all. Mm-hmm. Do you know anything about the man behind, hanging behind the Wellington rags? Oh, so that's what the RCM in Martinez is about. Great. Great to hear someone's finally taken care of that. Mm -hmm. So you do know something about it? No, no. Nothing. He was some kind of mercenary. But everyone here knows that. I'm just glad to hear you're looking into it. That's all. He's not feeling very comfy in his clothes. 
Is he? Strange. He didn't kill him or anything, but there's something going on here. Thank you for your cooperation. You little shit. It's every military blockade's middle with bullet holes crumbling. Bullet holes, I don't know why I said it like that. <laughs> bullet holes crumbling. I said it wrong again. Holes. Bullet holes. Not holes. <laughs> Please. Bullet holes. Okay, let's go up to the boardwalk and see what's going on. Hello, Chief. Sir. And Mikhail noticed the windows. Especially with how there are no windows on the south side. This was to deal with. A blonde man stands next to his son, pointing to the weather-worn ruins. He sees you approaching and smiles. You officers, come to investigate the historic subtext of West Martinez? I'm Tran Heilostam. You must be Kim Kitaragi, right? I was just telling my son about this building. Not a lot of people realize the historic significance here. Very rich in hypertext. Ah. Nice to meet you. Hold on. Hypertext? Yes, hypertext. Young Carp and the collection of cultural hyperlinks. Wait, what was that about the windows before? Oh, yes. So, Mikhail, they had to deal with monitor glare, especially in the summer. They still had vector monitors back then. That was 49 years ago. So they didn't have windows on the south wall. You and Kim know each other? No, I can't say that we've met before. But I've heard of Kim, of course. Mikhail, say hi to the officers. He rests his hands on the boy's shoulder. The child stays hidden behind the hem of his father's coat, clutching to his verm themed colouring book. Mikhail's a little tired today. We spent all night trying to run Orbis on his radio computer. Have you heard of it? It's a programming language used in Grad. Quite tricky, but he wanted to play this Grad-made adventure program. We've been getting really into verms lately. The man speaks in the artificial cadence of a professor, or someone who's been on too many radio shows. But I assume you're not here for giant verms when there are so many real things to see. Just as I was telling Mikhail before, this is where the Coalition landed in 08. We could be standing on what is the most interesting landmark in Revachol West. He points to the building again. Wow, get a load of this guy. He really enjoys his trivia. The Orbis programming language was named after its inventor, Victor Orbis, a cybernetician from Grad. They run Vox in the Occidental countries. What's so fascinating about an empty old building? Aha, but it's not just any empty old building. He raises his hand to his eyes, springtime sun warming his handsome face. All four of you turn to admire the mill before you. What a lot of people know is, this used to be the R&D department of Felt Electrical. And Felt, which now sells ink cartridges mostly, was once a top dog in the turn of the century cybernetics boom. Look at the building looming over it you. It looks old and weathered, with seagulls picking apart its stone and metal carcass. Bushy undergrowth has taken hold of the collapsed rooftop. Some kind of bird has set up a nest on a broken windowsill. Don't think I've ever heard of this foul electrical. That's not surprising. Only a vestigial ink cartridge and ferrotape manufacturer remains. He'd adjust his suit jacket. They started out as a midway electronics outfit in Königstein two centuries ago. After an aggressive move to Revachol, Feld became a global player in the emerging personal electronics market of the pre-revolutionary era. Still, Tricentennial was beating them in business machines. But Feld had an ace up their sleeve. Or should I say, they were developing an ace up their sleeve? I'm mixing my metaphors here. What was that ace? It was here in Martinez, possibly in this very building, that they developed prototypes for a tape computer. A tape computer? Mm -hmm. An elegant folding mechanism of rollers and ferrotape ribbons, portable enough to be a take-it-home solution revolutionizing business machines, possibly even bring them to the average consumer. This is like the IBM of this world. Which is a feat of engineering even today's giants, Rehm, ICN and Zam, haven't achieved yet. He grins, admiring the sentence he just produced. He assumes something like a combat stance, facing the wind. What happened? Indeed. What? The revolution! The boy wipes his nose on his sleeves. Unfortunately, their moonshot project never made it to the market. Feld's move to Revachol backfired. The revolutionary government liquefied their assets and expropriated those very advanced prototypes. Possibly from this very building, or one of the adjacent ruins. He pauses, pointing to the other building, then continues. All of this was built by Felt, even a boardwalk. Wild Pines built Martinez proper as a resort for their middle management. Felt built this side of town for R&D. You're saying that Felt Electrical built this boardwalk? Yes, they even built a pleasure wheel, but that got destroyed in the war. A pleasure wheel? The lieutenant looks wistfully at the horizon as if picturing gondolas rising to the sky. Yes. 
to lure in their star engineers. This part of Martinez was nothing but reeds before it felt arrived. They had to make the prospect of living here attractive. It was supposed to become a global center for innovation in cybernetics. But history had other plans. What happened to the engineers, the company people? Oh, I'm afraid it didn't end well for the boys. But this story is a bit too dark for little Mikael here. Now, if you were to ask about tape computers... Wait, is he saying that we should just bypass the excesses of the revolution? Tape computers, right. He's a kid. Tape computers. We don't need to talk about that right now. What do the revolutionaries do with these advanced tape they computers? They use them for military communications, but also to write and send out press releases. The most notorious example being Le Decret de Mars. What was that? What's the Mars Decree? I mean the radio transmission sent out to news agencies and world governments by the newly created Commune of Revachol on the 7th of March in the year 02. A short-lived legislative foundation for a short-lived utopia. I see. It's a beautiful piece of text, actually. A singer-songwriter I know, Charette, called it a love poem to Revachol on her political concept album, Bon Bessier dans le Lind. You should read it. Every local library in Revachol stocks a copy of the decree. I tried to get Mikhail to memorize it. Tried to. Someone was much too interested in worms to be paying any attention. How do those tape computers work? Do they work like radio Actually, computers? no one knows. No one even knows what a computer made entirely of tape would look like. But word has it, they were very elegant. Exquisite, alien-looking, turn-of-the-century hardware. He raises his finger remembering something. Buckle up. Ten years ago, I did a little freelancing, I guess you could say. I was a special consultant for an exhibition at the Womti Domti Dom Center in Vredeport, Oranje. It raised the same questions, and we had lengthy discussions with Paul Ockerman, who was head curator at the time. This was before the twins Keith and Guy Jews joined the team, trying to... The Womti Domti Dom. <laughs> Wait, did he just say Womti Domti Dom Center? What the hell is a Womti Domti Dom Center? And who the hell are Keith and Guy Juiced? What are you talking about, bro? The Womty Domty Dom Center for Contemporary Arts. The exhibition itself drew on Lagerman's notion of memory, and so there were some parallels. That's why the head curator, Paul Ockerman, chose to... You're making this up. Kim, is he making this up? In fact, I'm not. The Womty Domty Dom Center is a place you can visit if you're ever in Vredeport and are ever in the market for an exhibition space slash contemporary art research center. <clears throat> But perhaps I should return to the tape computers. As I was saying, the device itself was very elegant, fragile even. One could write directly on the tape using a special chemical solution. The machine would then analyze the handwriting, perform operations and project output onto a white screen. It was a beautiful, delicate thing. Made of black film and folding tape structures. Cool. Very, very cool. Though I understand the socio-economic causes of the revolution, it pains me to imagine the revolutionary setting fire to this precious device. But so they did. The felt playback experiment vanished into the fires of 07. The felt playback experiment? Yes, the official name of the prototype. Some sources report it as the felt playback experience. But those are incorrect. Why did the revolutionaries destroy it? Who knows? Maybe it was an accident, or maybe they didn't want the technology to end up in the wrong hands. Either way, they're all gone now. All three versions of the prototype. Nothing but debris and ashes remain inside that building. I see. I want to ask but something of course. else. <laughs> what else? Great, thank you for the information. No, interesting information. You for having me and little Mikhail here to pick your brain. A very interesting conversation indeed. Pick your brain? If anything, this was rather one-sided. He did the talking. Whatever. Whatever, bro. Another power box. It charges nothing now. It's empty. The fence blocks the path. No way on from here. Okay. So, the Wompty Dumpty Dom Center. Outsider. It's Wednesday evening and something heinously exciting is underway. People have gathered beneath the billowing roof of a novelly shaped trophy building, sipping wine and exchanging opinions. 29 year old Wonder Twins, Guy and Keith Juice, are the stars of the show with their bomber jackets and white sneakers, head curators of this art exhibition. It's the Wompty Dumpty de Dummiest event of the year and all the cool kids have RSVP'd. It shouldn't be RSVP'd. Where are you if you are not there?
I'm not sure I care to know about the Wompty Dumpty Dum Center. Bars cover these long, dusty windows. Making good progress, but I'm not sure what I'm supposed to be looking for. Someone has left an unidentifiable article of clothing on this railing. It smells really bad. Let's take a closer look. It's streaked with dried seagull shit and tangled with pieces of seaweed. A dangling arm suggests that there might be a jacket beneath the crust of filth. It seems likely that it was left in the surf until someone laid it out on this fence to dry out. Unfortunately, that just seems to have stiffened it into a shapeless mass. Please tell me you're not taking that with you. I think this is the jacket the idiot Doom Spiral guy wanted me to find. I'm sure he'll be thrilled to have it returned. I've got to return it. That's the right thing to do. Vagrants have recently painted the tarp red. Water drips from it. Mega Beano's prescription lenses. The coin operated weighing machine hasn't been used for a decade. A makeshift roof, vagrants have tried to make the boardwalk habitable. The tarp will keep out neither rain, nor snow, nor wind. So it's useless, essentially. A big wine canister, it's open and empty. Jesus, mate. The smell. It's awful and familiar. Hold on, that is awful. It doesn't help. You can still smell it. Keep it in now. Don't overreact. Breathe. Isn't it just the rotting fish? Don't be naive. No, no. Don't you recognize it? That idiot's pungency. That faintly oh, that guy's cloying dead. sweetness. Only death smells like that. Something cold wakes in the pit of your stomach. Fear. The signs of decaying meat. It announces itself from two dozen meters away. A warning. A memento mori. Heads up, Lieutenant. Something's not right here. The Lieutenant has already brought a handkerchief to his nose. Careful that the floorboards look rotten and weak. There's some tear. An empty cigarette package and a crumpled kebab wrapper in the trash bin. Examine the tear. Two empty bottles of Tallulah vodka and a can of black potent porter is all you find. A tragedy. The lieutenant looks in the can, eyes watering from the smell. Examine the cigarette Whoever package. Whoever tossed it here was a heavy smoker. The brand name reads Red Astra. Red Astra is the black market version of Astra cigarettes, known for their high tar content. Examine the kebab You wrapper. see traces of mayonnaise and ketchup on it, as well as a tomato wedge. The wrapper reads Shish Kebab Revachol. It's no older than a day or two. Mm. No mold yet. This guy's just died. There's some tear. Alright, mate. A man lies on the boardwalk. His limbs bent and neck turned at an unnatural angle. Right next to him is an empty bottle of spirits. In his cramped hand, a chewing gum wrapper. Half of his body has slipped between the cracked boardwalk, starting with the right leg. The fall has left him broken. Contorted like a sad puppet. Hold on. The lieutenant squats next to the corpse and examines his face. Two bulging eyes stare back at him, void of any signs of life. Lividity is faintly pronounced. Whoever this is has been dead for two days. No longer. He stands up we and shivers as a gust of He stands up and shivers as a gust of wind blows through his bomber jacket. We need to investigate. Another dead body. This is your job. Steal yourself. Calm now. Carefully. Just another day. Just another dead body. Mm -hmm. Breathe. Study the man's clothes. He's wearing mud caked boots, beige trousers, and an old brown leather jacket with a bright blue lining. There are traces of kebab sauce on his chest. The leather jacket suits him well. It must be custom made. Search his pockets. You find some sunflower seeds and a rain soaked library card folded into two. His jacket feels sodden and heavy under your hand. Good. We should take a look at that library card after this is done. Did he the man himself? The man has fallen through a crack in the boardwalk and hit his head against the metal bench. Coagulated blood covers his black hair. One of his feet is still dangling through the There hole. is junk. 
put his foot down on one of the rotten floorboards, it collapsed, he smashed his head off the side of the bench and that was the end of that. You have to be quite inebriated to fall that bad. Well over a litre of pure ethanol. Three bottles of wine or one and a half of spirits. Or maybe it was just dark. Examine his face. His expression is dull, like the sea behind him. Drops of water shining on his moustache. His eyes, empty and wide, look frightening in their frozen gaze. Height, 170 to 175 centimeters. Curly hair, stout build, age approximately 50 to 60 years. So do the surroundings. There's some dried blood on the metal bench, right where the corpse's head rests. The floorboards are rotten and slippery wet around the hole. An empty bottle lies nearby. A chewing gum wrapper is clutched in his fist. Examine the man's head. A dried chunk of blood covers the hair at the back of his head. An open wound. It's sticky and cold to your touch. This is what killed him. I don't see any other major wounds, do you? It's hard to say. It seems like the head wound was fatal. It's exactly the shape of the bench. Step, uh, examine the bottle. A 0.75 liter Tulula vodka with its cap missing. There's hardly anything left inside. It's mid-market spirits with a slight touch of menthol. The man meant to enjoy himself, have a good time. Tear all around us. He looks at two of the bottles near the coin operator viewer, then at your yellow plastic bag. I'd prefer if you didn't collect them this time. It's not proper. Examine the chewing gum wrapper. Rabowski spearmint chewing gum. Green leaves on the cover. The man's mouth is half agape from the terror of the fall. Let's look in. The blackness of death. Stench. You think you see white chewing gum too? He ate the whole pack, right? It's to cover the smell of alcohol before going home. The worst thing is, I've seen it before. Almost the same scenario. Even the chewing gum. It's always the same. Let's step on the floorboards. They screech under your feet ominously. It's hard to say whether the dead man's weight was the cause of the boardwalk to break. It definitely looks fragile. He could have easily disappeared into the sea through that hole. And you would have never found him. Step back. The entire boardwalk creaks in the wind as you take a step back. Who is this man? Looks like one of the locals. He'd have to know this spot to come here. You don't just walk over here. You look south the way you came. But that's just a lazy assumption. What do you think? At least this man knew how to party. Imagine the same scene without the bottle. Now that would be just sad. Looks like just another old drunkard to me. And he was married. The lieutenant points the ring on the man's left hand, the flesh around it swollen and grey. But let's try to not run ahead. For now, all we know is that he's an unidentified middle-aged man found dead on the Martinez boardwalk. What do you think happened here? Death by misadventure. He slipped and fell through the boardwalk. A truly unfortunate accident. If it wouldn't have been for that bench, he'd be alive. Do you think he was drunk? Oh, yes. What about alcohol poisoning, liver failure? Some symptoms of acute alcohol poisoning could have definitely played a role here. Severe confusion respiratory depression, and predictable behavior. But I think that death arrived through head trauma, not liver failure. Right. It does seem to be a pretty straightforward misadventure, although there's still a question of identifying the body. What should we do with him? From where I stand, I can see two options. We either take the case and follow the leads to identify the body on our own, or we report back to the station and leave this for our colleagues to handle. We found him. We should finish this. All right. We should first examine the library card you found. Then we can call the station from my kinema. Let them know we are taking the case. Cool. Joey takes all the cases in the known universe, part 53. The coin operator view has been out for order for years. Stop messing with the coin view and hold on to something. The wind is so strong. Right. Let's investigate the card. The library card is folded into two and still slightly wet to the touch. The front side reads, Central Jamrock Public Library Card, issued to Billy Mejean, expires July 53. Billy is a unisex name. Could be the deceased, or his family member. Look inside. Whoever owns this card is an avid reader. You find a list of books written in blue pencil. Radio thriller. Stand a little less between me and the sun. 
The last one in the list is The Glinton Curve by M. Theobald. A library stamp indicates that the book has been returned. Most of these titles seem to be in the sci-fi genre. Some mm. thrillers too. Let's look at the back side. If lost, please return the card to the library. Dial 005-0255211 or visit us at Moreau Street 78 Jamrock. Business hours 900 to 1800. Good. We should give them a call from my kinema. See if we can learn anything about Billy Mejon. Thank you. And then the jacket. As you hold it in your hands, it makes an uncomfortable crunching sound. Man, how did this jacket get so disgusting? It's a sordid, filthy tail. Not for the weak. Not sure I can. Are you sure you can stomach it? Some secrets are better left uncovered. Don't even try. Seriously. Think about it. It occurs to you that you're not even holding the jacket itself, but rather the thick crust of jetsam and seagull shit that ensconces it. Both. Why? Why did you think about it? Look at your hands. They're covered in muck. Ew, ew, ew. Flick your hands. Now you're just flicking that shit everywhere. This is a disaster. You'll never get the smell out. That's fine. I bought many things for this exact purpose. To not have to worry about occasionally losing morale because you realise you've got shit on your hands. Um... Yeah, I put, if it was me, Joey the human, I probably wouldn't take it. I, I don't deal with me, um, uh, blah, 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 muck very well. Someone must have worked hard to smash the plastic dome. A metal paper under a yellow plastic dome. You could use it to call someone, unless you're out of Let's change. Let's pick up the handset. Boop, boop, boop. You hear the tone. The machine is inoperable. Put 10 cents in, dial a random number, 0524031115. Calling. Still calling. This feels wrong. Should you be doing this? End of tone. Someone picks up. Pierre? Is that you, Pierre? Yes, it's me, Pierre. Very nice of you to find the time to call me. It gets so lonely. Even the animals have died. What kind of pets did you have? Oh, Her voice is drowned in white noise. Sounds like waves washing a beach, growing in volume until the call suddenly disconnects. You get a sinking feeling. It makes you look if Lieutenant Kitsuragi overheard you. To your relief, he did not. I call the same number before. No, it's now a different, different random number. Calling, still calling someone with a masculine voice, picks up. Hello, Gerard speaking. Hello, Gerard. Technically speaking, your electricity. No, what you are is a surprise. Get his wife on the phone. Hey, Gerard, get your wife for me, will you? Who, who is this? I'm Harry. Turn her on. I don't like waiting. Who the fuck do you think you are talking to me like that? Guillaume, Guillaume Lemillion. Hey, funny asshole. Why don't you grow up? Oh, and Disco is dead. Phone hanging up. Disconnect tone. <laughs> I can just phone random n numbers and waste all my money if I want. It's me. The guy who's fucking your wife. <laughs> I d maybe she is cheating on him and it somehow like solves his problems, but I, I, it's the sort of thing where you don't really want to just fuck around with that kind of stuff. Ruining people's lives for fun is not necessarily what I want to be doing with my time. It's not not what I want to be doing. I guess. But uh, I have no strong opinion about it either way. The barrel has been recently discarding. It still smells of fuel oil. Discarded. The chain trails off into the ocean to do who knows where. The rusty gears used to turn the whole frickin' machine. Okay, so there's still more north. I can keep going north for quite a while. Plain white polo shirt. Beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Let's go try and open the bunker up and see what's there.
Is that there, sir? Old door, worn by elements, guards the depot. The wind has blown a sand dune in front of it. The door hasn't been opened in a long while. You see a handle. It's a red check. I can only try and open the door once. What is this thing it's anyway? Military. A service depot of some sort. Used to service what? Probably something that is no longer there. Okay. I don't need to try and open this door. Um, unless my interfacing was godly and then I could try and open it. But it is not godly. You see that seagull up there? Remind you of anybody? Me? Exactly. Why am I like a seagull? Think about the seagull story. It's one of endurance and adaptation. The seaside was paradise once. They were birds of that paradise. Mm. Then their paradise became shit city. And what did they do? They became urban survivors, eating burgers out of trash cans, killing and eating pigeons. Mm. No time for that sentimental bullshit. They're hustlers getting shit done. They're one pair of track pants away from gangsters, just like you. Fucking right, whatever it takes to survive, I am the seagull. Right. Steal hot dogs, shit in the sand, whatever it takes to keep going. I'm the fucking seagull, okay? <laughs> the, the machinations of a madman. Someone's made a campfire here a long, long time ago. A rusted, broken control box, the radio relay tower. I've got three points to spend. Just whenever we need to. The ladder's too rusty to climb. The sea air is eating away at it. The relay tower coordinates broke traffic in the bay, barely. Scented scarf. Tiny units say off in the far distance where the posts trail onward. I'm going to get so much experience when I do all this shit. It's going to be beautiful. I'm certainly learning a lot of things. I'm glad I explored this area. The ice flow looks a bit thin here. I don't really want to crack into the ice and murder myself. Particularly. Okay, so that's the end of that section. And the church comes back on the left, so we can't get anything else done here. But that doesn't mean we're done. Just got to do that so I don't have to see the the glowing. Call Jamak Public Library for information on Library Card's owner. And I've got to go give him his jacket back. Assuming it is his jacket. I mean, depends on how long ago he lost the jacket. But I do wonder, because it's so covered in shit, if he lost it so long ago that he's forgotten. Maybe the things he's talking about that have happened to him also happened years and years and years ago. And so you'll never find... like. Good luck finding a key unless it's inside his house, in which case just break open your own house door. But if it was years ago, the house has probably long since been abandoned. Alright mate, how you doing? Tequila Sunset. I found your jacket. Ah, tequila. I knew you'd come through. That's fucking great, man. I found a little more than I bargained for. What's that supposed to mean? Uh, there's a dead body nearby. What's that got to do with my jacket? Probably nothing. Forget about it. Let me see. What? This isn't my jacket. My jacket was beautiful. This is fucking filthy. What am I supposed to do with this? What do you expect? You left outside for a week. I'm not taking a disgusting pile of hobo rags. I may be in an irrecoverably decaying orbit, but I've still got standards. Either bring it back the way it was before, or find a dumpster to burn it in. You know, despite the guano, it looks like the jacket itself is stain resistant. It may just need a good scrubbing. Hey. Wash the dirty jacket. How the fuck am I gonna do that? I might need to give it to like the, the hostel. Maybe they have cleaning facilities. You can go clean it. Oh, I can't actually get there from here. Okay. It's like sealed off. All right. Well, let me get to uh, Revachol again, Martinet's main area, so I can remember to do the phone call bit. 
You need like a washing machine or like a, a thing to wash something with. A good scrubber. Oh my god, it's me. Just check in with the right, right click. You gotta check these things. You see, I can make it back way faster than they'll let me walk back, I'm sure. Okay, first of all, let me go speak over here and see if I can wash this. Oh, also, I can do this again now. I've got visual calculus buff. I can do the tracks again. You see a set of tire tracks in the brown slush that covers yep. the plaza mosaic. Reconstruct the movement. The tire tracks were left here by an unknown event that took place some days ago. It's a message written in the language of burnt rubber. Some of that rubber stuck to the tiles right in front of the whirling in rags. This is point A. The driver started there and then accelerated straight into the fence, left a hole big enough for the Franco-Nigerian cavalry. According to the cafeteria manager, what happened next? The driver proceeded to back out of the yard, barely stopping before hitting the adjacent building. Before heading south, must have been in a hurry. This is where I started off with my motor carriage for sinking it in the sea. No wonder the cafeteria manager seemed frustrated when he was giving us directions to the yard. Well, you did provide us with a very convenient access point to the crime scene. I think I got it. Okay, so that's done. Needed to do that just so I could see what was what. I like the idea of having a thought cabinet. That's pretty cool. Alright, mate. Can I use your washing machine? Can I help you? God, I found a new bird for the whirling. What is this thing? It's no biggie, I just thought it'd look nice on the wall on that kind of cot. What, the interior decorating kind? You know, I'm sorry, this is actually a nice bird. A competent piece of taxidermy. I can fix it to the plaque and have a new bird in the establishment, I guess. So, I don't know. Thank you. I'm gonna go with thank you. This was mostly about the fucking cardio. Massive cardio here. Mm -hmm. You live till 90. Or you get a heart attack from running. I feel good about our work here today. It's all about the little things, like bringing people random stuffed animals. It's not actually about that, but he liked it. All right, all right, mate. Again? I can't believe this shit. Now let's talk about the hypothetical okay. 41 again. Can't imagine it anymore. Neither can I, partner. Neither can I. Who yes, shades your own disguise? As if waiting for some kind of reaction or response. Something to click. It's not happening, though. Okay, I still don't know who he is. Yes? What is it? Look, as soon as you leave me, are we or are we not from the same police station? God damn it, you leave her alone. Keep your weird bullshit to yourself and be professional for once, for fuck's sake. Can I actually help you with something? Yes, of course. Preposterous. I mean, you would remember if they were, right? Who forgets their squad mates? That's not possible. Are you with him? Of course I'm with him. Why do you ask? Seems like a cool guy. Well, he's not. He's a sack of shit barely kept together by crazy glue. But at least he tries, unlike you. Please, let's not turn this into another exchange, okay? Okay. Goodbye. <laughs> Lena, I told I, I met your oh, husband. Oh, hello, dear. There you are again. I ran into your husband on the coast. Goodness. H how is he? Did he say why he hasn't returned yet? The old woman clasped her hand together over He's a blanket. Fine, As we had suspected, he couldn't get back earlier because the water lock on the canal was broken. Now he's just finishing up some work. Oh, yes. That's my morel. He's bound to catch a cold staying out there for so long. But I am so relieved to hear that he's okay. Thank you for putting an old woman's heart at ease, if even a little. You haven't, however. There are dangers out there. Our aging bodies fail. Her heart won't rest until Morel is safely back with her. That's all for now, ma'am. 
Okay, so I just do that to get that out of the way. Right, now I'm going to save outside the motor carriage so I don't have to do something with the motor carriage. Because it's going to be two days until I play again. Okay, so I'll see you guys next time when I phone the motor carriage library up, see what this dead body's all about, and then I've got some other things to do. We've got to phone him back in a call her back in a day, which will be day four. And I've got to also speak to Joyce because I can uh, get my badge. I've got my badge, so I can do that. Okay. See you guys then. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.